Wow, you're here, you're ready. Always ready. This is, always ready, this is John Burns. With the Greater European Mission, page 47 is their two page, and uh, page 49 is their response form. I've heard of Greater European Mission for years. I was surprised to see that it was founded in 1949, and I'm really excited to hear what they're doing today. John? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm from England. Where are you from? I don't mean like, you know, Newport Beach. I mean like origins, where you're from. I've been chatting with several of you before we started, and I've met some people from some really exotic places, some places in Africa and Asia, and then some of you, I guess, are from Texas. <laughs> uh, I'm allowed to do that joke because I live in Dallas now. Okay. But where are your origins from? My guess is loads of you have family origins somewhere in Europe. I've got a friend, some of you will know, George Andrews. And I stayed with him recently, and he'd just done his Ancestry.com. And guess where he's from? The clues in the title, George, St. George, Andrews, St. Andrews. Lo and behold, he's half English, half Scottish. I've already met people here today that are from Holland, that are from Holland and that are from Italy. I wonder if you know where you're from originally. We've got a great little booklet I would love you to take. And for lots of you that are originate from Europe, you'll find the country of your great-grandmother or whatever it is, and we'd love you to just grab it and pray for Europe. And uh, also in there, there's a little QR code. I'm going to show you a life change story in a moment. And we've got another bunch of them racked up there you can watch as well. So why do I want to talk to you about Europe? Well, very simply, Europe needs you. My continent needs you. And I want to explain some ways you can engage with us. You might say, why a mission to Europe? Great Europe mission, why? Surely they've got loads of churches. Yeah, we've got loads of buildings. We haven't got loads of thriving faith communities. Europe is the most unreached continent in the world. Less than 2% of people in Europe would be committed evangelical Christians. In fact, it's very difficult to find a community with even 2%. We had a lady over here speaking recently from Holland, and where she lives in a few little towns around her, they can't even find half of a percent of committed Christians. That means, just let me put it in real ugly terms for you, 22,000 people die in Europe every, every day, and 21,500 of them are not going to be with us in heaven. That's what it means. Unreached is a missiological term, but if it's 21,500 faces every day that are not going to be in heaven, it breaks my heart. It's unreached, it's critical. It's been the center of history and art and theology and culture. And it still is in lots of ways. The whole world has come to Europe. And you can reach the whole world in Europe. It's ready. Jem was born on the back of a crisis 72 years ago, the end of the Second World War. But Europe's been in crisis again recently, hasn't it? Economic crisis and all that's gone on with Greece and other places, and then the immigration crisis of the last few years, and then the pandemic crisis of the last 18 months that we've shared in. And it's ready to be reached. Not only is there new Europeans that have flooded onto our shores that are ready for the gospel, you've got all inherited Europeans who've had their foundations turned upside down by the insecurity of the last few years. Europe's ready to be reached. I've mentioned that we were born after World War II. Um, the greatest generation, right? Where Americans came to our aid and bailed us out. We were founded by an incredible guy, uh, Bob Evans. We've actually got his book at the back. You can come and grab one on our table. We've got a whole bunch of copies for you. It's a great read of his story where he, where he found himself in Europe on the back of the Second World War as a military chaplain who went to help out the American boys and found that the need of Europe was incredible. And he started the mission. Um, Ruth Graham, Billy's wife, came up with the name. 
and uh, Dr. Billy Graham was our first ever donor, and they sent him to start this mission to Europe. And so since 1949, we've been sending missionaries, mainly from America, and then the last few years from all over the world. Over 1,500 missionaries we've sent in those 70 years. We've partnered with about 3,000 churches across Europe to help them come to life, find ways to disciple and reach out again. We've equipped over 3,000 people. In formal settings, we had over 20 Bible seminaries across Europe and informal settings, teaching people in cities to reach out again. Currently, if you had a look at GEM, you'd find us in 27 countries with about 740 workers. We're supported by about 1,300 churches from around the world and about 18,000 people that support our workers. We're actually the only singularly focused mission to and for Europe in America. Founded here in Wheaton, Wheaton, Chicago. Actually, my chairman's here tonight, Rob Boo, and he's the senior pastor of Wheaton Bible Church, and that's where we were born all those years ago. And you know what? We're in this incredible time where Jem is ready to push forward. We haven't had our best days. They're just coming. We're growing like never before. More and more people are applying to come and work with us. More and more donors are stepping up and, and funding projects in cities that they have a heart for. More and more people are diving in with us, partnering with us. We can, we can feel something happening, and we're here to, tonight to invite you to join in with it. Here's a little video about who we are. Nearly 80 years ago, a generation accepted what would become their greatest mission. Joining a struggle against tyranny, darkness and death. But when the war was over, a very different battle began. Europe, the continent of cathedrals, home of the Reformation, the place St. Paul himself planted churches had begun to lose hope. After two total wars, decades of devastation and destruction, and the seemingly senseless loss of so many, many lives, the long legacy of Christianity in Europe started to slip away. This was the crisis that gave birth to Greater Europe Mission. Our founder, a chaplain called to bolster up American boys, found that it was the local people in France, weary and jaded, who needed him more. And so it began, the slow reconstruction, and a wave of courageous, compassionate gem missionaries responded bringing back the scholarship it would take to raise up faithful young leaders, building into believers through life-on-life -life discipleship, championing the local church to reach, grow, and multiply. But now in a new era, Europe faces crisis once again. Cathedrals may welcome in thousands for tours, but the pews are empty. People are more connected than ever, but their hearts are lonely, longing. Addiction and depression darkens far too many doors, while war, hunger and disease drive millions to Europe's shores, seeking hope. So it seems our greatest mission lies yet before us. When I think about GEM's mission and vision, if we reach Europe, we can change the world. With a population that's almost three quarters of a billion people, Europe is at a unique point in history for the gospel. My greatest mission is making disciples. To get to participate in that is the greatest honor that I have. Our region probably registers less than 1% professing Christians. A changed life, transformed right before your eyes, is a beautiful thing. 
Many of these people are coming in from places that I, as a North American, would have a hard time getting into, and yet now they're coming to us. What greater joy, what greater adventure to use our lives for. God is on the move. New doors for the gospel are opening. Opportunities abound. Churches are asking for help and support. Partnership and unity in the body of Christ is growing. A movement of transformation is swelling, even now. And so today, the stage is set for the great battle of our time. A battle not for power or politics, but for the very heart and soul of a people. It is our turn to rise, to respond. Because for them, millions of Europeans, all lost and looking, this is the moment on which eternity rests. Like Steve before me, we're crazy about transformation. I want to see my continent transformed. And that means seeing lives transformed one by one by one. I keep getting accused of being in the numbers game and I say, I am. I'm absolutely in the numbers game. One by one by one by one. We want to reach people in relevant ways. We have missionaries and staff and workers committed to all kinds of things. Youth ministry, street ministry. Um, refugee ministry. In fact, on one island on the on, uh, outskirts of Greece, we saw 100 um, Muslims baptized last year alone, just working with refugees. Stunning, stunning piece of work. We want to make disciples who make disciples. We, we need a, a discipleship movement. And actually, we need a discipleship revolution in the American church as well as the English church and the French church and everything else. We've got to teach people to follow Jesus in such a way that other people will follow him and be intentional about preparing them to reach their friends. A simple discipleship revolution. That's what we want to see in Europe. That's what we're starting to see in several places. And we love the church. We support churches all over Europe that are trying to reach out. And where there isn't a thriving church, we plant, we plant churches. I don't imagine how many churches we've planted over the last... 70 years, but it's probably over a 1,000 churches. We're not a denomination. We help people plant, we equip them, and they find their own partnerships. So if it's all about life change, one by one by one, let me show you one that I really love. I grew up in a small town which is called Bonneuil. I was living with uh, my mother who was a single mom. My mother was my father's uh, mistress and that was very painful to me. Every time my father was coming over I thought like hell was coming back into my life. teenager, I was thinking that it would have been better if I was not born. I was just giving my body. It was just the easiest way for me to deal with all that. And in the midst of all that, I uh, felt pregnant. And so it got worse and worse because then I was having my daughter go through the same things I was going through. And I, I just hated myself even more. I couldn't stand that. All this hatred rose up in my life. And I started being violent with my daughter. And I started being violent with my daughter. The worst was when my mother passed away. She left me alone, even there. So it was like she even chose death over me. Now my whole world is not just upside down, it's just like there's no reason for me to be, to live. And now I have this baby and I don't want this baby anymore. I was so, so, so depressed. 
I felt like I, I had thought about my own self not being worthy and I spent years hating a person and I was just doing the exact same thing. And so I just hated myself even more. All of a sudden I, I shifted and I was like, no, I don't want to die. I just wanted God to listen to me. So I cried out to God, I don't know who you are, I don't know your name, don't even know if you truly exist, but if you do, save us. He answered. He came and he saved us. I gave my life to Jesus, but it's almost like right away I knew there was more. One day, my daughter comes back from school and uh, she's like, Mom, you're never going to believe it. In my classroom, there is a friend of mine. Her father is a pastor. And she's like, yeah, and they're, they're real Christians, they're just like we are. And so I was like, okay, that's great. When we first met Sophie, you could just tell that, just, that she loved Jesus so much. And to then start to hear her story, we were just uh, just so blown away. I had all this joy and all this peace, and I wanted to share it with anybody I would I would meet. From our perspective, it was a huge answer to prayer to find someone locally here in our town that was open to to being discipled. We had an opportunity to to share with her some and, and to um, start discipling her. I get to share with other women what Jesus did for me. How he redeemed my past and how he transformed our lives. For her to actually join our church plan and was open to being trained and was teachable and was willing to also go out into the streets and share the gospel with people and pray for people. Now, thanks to Jim, God is using me to impact my neighbors and my community and the people around me. I've been able to equip my children and now they are sharing their faith with their friends. He really redeems everything because those same hands that used to beat my daughter, he used them to baptize her. <laughs> have to speak after that. I never quite can. <laughs> Let me tell you some ways you can help us in our work in GEM. Um, I actually believe there's 30 or 40 people here tonight that are meant to help us. I've been praying for you for a while. And there's ways you can help. We, uh, we know that every move of God starts with prayer, and we're desperate for people to commit to prayer. That's why probably the most important publication we have is this Prayer for Europe book. On your way out, we'll have uh, my chairman and, and Heidi Andrews just giving these out. Just take one and, and commit to prayer with us for Europe, would you? We actually want 740,000 prayer warriors praying for 740 million Europeans. I'm starting a prayer thing next year, every Friday from a different city in Europe. You can join me online. I just come and pray with me. Also, in these little booklets is a QR code with another five stories like that. I'd love you to watch. Come and see. Come and see what's going on. In your uh, booklets there, it says that we've got a President's Congress in Rome in October. We've actually pushed it back to April, and I'd love loads of you to come and see. Just come and see what God's doing. Come and meet some of our partner churches. Come and see some of our missionaries at work. George and Heidi did that, and uh, it's kind of ruined their lives, and now they're involved with us. And I'm hoping it's going to ruin your life just the same. And uh, maybe come for a while longer. We've just started a program called Tend to Legacy, where we're inviting people over the age of 50 to come for six weeks and serve alongside a missionary. We'll train you for a week, put you alongside a missionary. And actually, I was speaking at an event like this 
in Southern California a few months ago, and a couple have just sold their business so they can come and run it for us. A couple of volunteers, just people like you who said, yeah, we're in, we'll come and help. So come and help. Come and speak to us afterwards, fill in that form, and let's go and reach Europe, shall we? Thank you. Page 49 is the response form. Page 49. Remember we talked earlier about God prompting you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I appreciate you said that. I've been praying for 30 or 40 people here tonight to respond. Maybe you're one of those. I hope so. Okay? Let me pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for John. Um, incredible story of transformation but also just that thought, Europe, Europe needs us. They need our help. And uh, for Jem, the future is just the beginning. Father, help us to realize 21,500 people will die without knowing you today. And Father, I pray for John, for this organization, this incredible history that you would use them in Europe, across Europe, in each of these cities, in lives like we saw. Father, I pray that you would call some of us here to go yeah. and to serve and to give. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, John. Appreciate it.